Hi, I'd like to thank you all for joining me today. My name is Yvette Krejci, and I'm the InReach Coordinator for the Northwest Central Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Network. Today I'll be talking a little bit about who we are and what we do. We are one of 12 other networks throughout Alberta. We have a very large geographical area, and we cover many different towns throughout the region. We start kind of by Thorhild, Boyle, Athabasca, Westlock, Barhead, Marathorp, and we head up towards Edson, Hinton, and Jasper. And in these areas, we are setting up for assessment and diagnosis. We're meeting with the communities to support services for individuals who are suspected and affected of FASD. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is also known as FASD. It's a medical diagnosis, and with that medical diagnosis, there's three different areas so that you can get a diagnosis with it. We can get FASD with facial features, and with that, that's when mom has consumed alcohol on the 19th, 20th, and 21st day of pregnancy, and that is the only time that an individual can get facial features. FASD without facial features, that is testing that they went through the assessment process and they have three or more domains which are impaired. At risk of FASD is also one that we work with very often. This comes into play when we have individuals who are unable to get that confirmation of prenatal alcohol exposure. So if we can't get confirmation that mom consumed alcohol, we still work with the individual at risk of until we can get more information. The slide here comes into play. I find it extremely important because it shows how the fetus is affected throughout pregnancy. In the first stages, it starts with the central nervous system and the heart and continues to grow as the fetus gets older. That's why we say FASD is a spectrum. Individuals who drink throughout their pregnancies can have different impairments with their fetus. Sometimes if it's only within that first trimester, as it shows you here, it would be the eyes, the ears, the heart, central nervous system, and the brain. And then things grow on as the fetus grows. So when we're talking about how does the alcohol get to that fetus, whatever mom consumes throughout the pregnancy goes completely to the fetus. It, cr it crosses through the placenta barrier 100%. So the ratio for the fetus with the alcohol is one to one. So if mom consumes a couple of drinks, so does the fetus. Mom's body will process the alcohol a lot quicker because of her size and metabolism, It'll, but it will take the fetus a lot longer. Prenatal alcohol exposure confirmation requires confirmation from the biological mother. We always have those conversations with moms and we have to be careful when we do so because there's so many stigmas out there that women are scared. They're scared to have those conversations and talk about having that drink or two while they were pregnant. I know um, we have a woman who come and say that, well, as soon as I found out I was pregnant, I never had another drink. So then we'll ask them the questions, what stage did you find out you were pregnant? And was it possible, did you have some kind of social gathering before you found out you were pregnant? And then we always take those into account. Because even myself, I knew from the day that that test said was positive, so I knew I was pregnant and couldn't drink and stuff like that. I never thought to think, hey, what about those days beforehand? Lots of times when we go out and we are using red solo cups, say that we're at a function, we're camping and stuff like that, do you know anybody that actually has that ounce right there and they're measuring? Usually that's only when we're out in facilities like pubs, bars, restaurants, and they do that because we're paying for that alcohol. But if we're at social gatherings and we're doing it ourselves, that's when things change. I know myself, it will be just a free flow. You throw some ice in and pour some and off you go. So in one of the high schools, I did a bit of a presentation with the kids and I asked one of the girls, she's like, well, I only had two drinks. What's the big deal? And I said, come on. I said, come join me. Let's, you know, you pour your drink, I'll pour mine. And we did. And then at the end, I took her glass and I poured it out into shot glasses. And she was surprised. She couldn't believe that what she had poured in her glass filled three and a half shot glasses. So when we're having those conversations with women, we're trying to ask them, how many drinks did you have? And on how many occasions? So for that young girl, she told me she only had two drinks that night, but technically she had six or more. So when we're talking about binge drinking for prenatal alcohol confirmation, we need four or more drinks on two separate occasions or one drink consecutively for seven days. 
When we look at going through the assessment process and what is needed, we have a team. We have a wonderful team. We have an adult, um, adults team for assessment diagnosis and a pediatric team. For our adults team, we have the physician, the OT, and the psychologist along with our clinic coordinator. And for pediatrics, we have the psychologist, the occupational therapist, and the pediatrician. Together, they will make your assessment complete. We will get together, go in for two different days. Adults have their own testing days as long with, along with children. And for adults, you'll go in and you'll do a little bit of brainstorming with the psychologist and the occupational therapist. And with that, you'll be asked questions about how do you budget? Can you write a check? What if? What if you're in the kitchen and something started on fire? What would you do? It's all life skills and stuff. So we're trying to see where you're at. And with the children, it's a lot more hands-on in a different way. They're doing some reading, some math, and stuff like that. It's getting to know where they're at within the school system and where they're at academically, their cognitive and language and speech. FASD is that invisible disability. If we see somebody with Down syndrome, we know that they have Down syndrome. We talk to them differently, we approach them differently. Somebody with FASD, you, you can't tell that they have FASD. You can't look at them and say, oh, I think that person over there has FASD. Oh, I think you have FASD. It's a medical diagnosis. It takes a clinic team to do so. So some of the primary disabilities when we look at that, we're looking at lower intelligence, trouble with social skills, reasoning, understanding, attention, sensory. Think about sensory. We're in a room with lights everywhere. If one of these lights was flickering, we would continue on with our day like it's no big deal. Somebody with FASD wouldn't even be able to focus to this conversation. They would be constantly looking at the light and it would be driving them crazy. Even the person next to them bouncing their leg, all they hear is that fabric rubbing together, rubbing together. It's enough for their skin to crawl. We have to take these things into consideration, that their sensories are like 100 times higher than ours. What you see is not what you get, and that is so true. This is a great visual. Individuals, their actual age is 18. They can talk the talk, walk the walk, like they're 20. But when we break things down, the reading ability, they're not too bad. Um, living skills, it would be like somebody in an 18-year-old body, but their living skills are at 11. Would you leave your 11-year-old child home alone? No. But when people are assessed and diagnosed with FASD, they're expected to live on their own. They're expected to pay their bills. They're expected to go buy their groceries, show up at court dates, whatever it may be. But they are not functioning at that. What you see is not what you get. We have to realize their maturity level could be at six years of age. So we're wondering why they're hanging around with younger children, and lots of people think that it's inappropriate. We have the average brain. The average brain, we process things, we put it in a certain area, we know where to go back and grab it from. Individuals with FASD, they say it's like everything's everywhere, like it'll be there one day and not the next. They might remember how to do something one day and not know how to do it the next, and that's very common. So with individuals with FASD, we like to do things in small increments and make sure that it's that repetition of things all the time and reminders. Lots of times it's important to use visuals. Visuals are huge. I find if we are doing visuals with individuals, we're giving them that chance that it's not always reminding them or saying, oh, how come you forgot? If we have things set up for them, they see them and they remember. I have individuals who will text me and say, hey, do you remember I have an appointment today? Because we've put those things up in their house. We've put the little stickies, we've put the calendars, we send the texts, we set them up for success. We try to do as many things as possible for them. It's the little things that work. So if we're doing a lot of repetition, the doctor's appointments, let's do them on a Monday at 2 p.m. Every doctor's appointment. Addictions is always a Thursday at 2 p.m. Lots of individuals do better in the afternoon, so let's work around their strengths instead of setting them up for failure. Be mindful of memory. Having problems with memory is really hard with routines, procedures, and stuff like that. That's why advocating and supporting is really important. Um, clients with memory lots of times feel like they just don't fit in and that they're not part of you know, society like everybody else. But it's okay. We all learn differently. Let's 
travel that road a little bit more. It's like that gravel road. Let's travel it and travel it and travel it until we get it paved. The more we do repetition, the more we do things the same, the better chance of learning it is for our individuals that we work with. Hands-on learning. Teach them, show them, ask them to repeat it. Because lots of times they're gonna tell you, yeah, I know, oh, it's good, no, I got it. And then they might not want to just say, hey, I didn't get it. So asking them to tell you how they want to do it and working with it that way, nobody wants to be told what to do. They've been told enough throughout their life what to do and how to do it. I like to ask my clients, okay, well, there's this, this is what you want to do, how do you want to do it? They might ask, like, well, what do you recommend? And I can give some scenarios, but let's put it on them. Let's empower them. Lots of individuals struggle with, say, keeping employment or even getting employment. Depending on which kind of community that you work in, sometimes a smaller community is better. Individuals might do better doing a night shift than a day shift. Lots of them struggle with getting to work on time, missing work. It's really important if we do get them that employment opportunity or if they've gotten that employment opportunity to support them. Maybe have a chat with their boss and just explain, you know what, there might be times that they might be late or there might be times that they're not feeling well and unable to come in. Is this going to work? And make it achievable for them. Talk with them. Set things up in their house with visuals, alarms, and stuff like that so that they can make it there on time. So who is the FASD offender? We need to know who we are working with, who our clients are. We need to have those conversations and see where did they come from? What was life like for them? Did they come from a secure, stable home? Were they tossed around in foster cares? Did they attend school? How many schools did they attend? Did they have that consistency of nurturing, caring, and love? It all comes back into play. Lots of individuals with FASD have come from broken homes. They've been in foster care. They don't have anybody that they can turn to or anybody that's willing to help anymore because they burnt those bridges. It's, we gotta look at the big picture, the whole picture. It's not like, oh, we're gonna fix this because you know what, we're not. We're going to maintain the best we can to help them move forward. So were they in trouble as a youth in the justice system and where did that end them? And what damage and trauma did that cause them? And how can we help them move forward? So it's finding those things of why they are where they are at at this moment and trying to move them forward and breaking that cycle. And lots of individuals with FASD, they know they're different. They don't know why they're different. They struggle with that on a daily basis. And that's why coming through, having the assessment and diagnosis is huge. I've had many of my clients after their assessment say, oh, why didn't I get this sooner? Like, now I know why I don't always get things. And now that's probably why I was struggling and that's why I didn't do very good in school and stuff. It's not that shame and blame, it's that sense of belonging, knowing who they are. So when we communicate with somebody with FASD, I know it's hard when we're sometimes in facilities and things are very regimented and things are on schedule and have to go, but you know what? Our clients do better with schedule. They do better with routine. They actually say, I do better when I'm in jail because they say, you know what? There's a time I have to get up. There's a time to eat. There's a time for chores. Like everything is scheduled. Individuals with FASD, do better with schedules. That's why it's nice to have routine and a lot of repetition. We just have to remember that when we're dealing with somebody with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, that we break things down. We don't ask them to do a bunch of things at once. Maybe it's one thing. Maybe put that sign up for them with three main things or three main chores that you're wanting them to get done. Start small and see where it goes, right? We can't, it's easier to grow from something than to give them a whole bunch and have them crash and have an outburst and have them put into a situation where they're not able to communicate because they're going to shut down. It's going to be that fight or flight. We need to accept individuals for who they are. We need to build off their strengths and what they can do. It's not knocking them down. It's not saying, oh, you can't do that or you're not good at that. You know what? Find what they're good at. Build off what they're good at because they are amazing. Like, together, building them and building their capacity is huge. We need to advocate for them and support them instead of knocking them down. We need to be there and getting them to those appointments. We need to break that cycle. You know what? Just because they missed that appointment and stuff, all they need is that reminder, and then they wouldn't have breached 
they would have been at court if they had that phone call or maybe had that ride. We need to remember FASD is permanent brain damage. It's not reversible and there is no cure. We need to support an advocate, but there is hope. Many women have said that when they get released, they just go back to that toxic relationship or to the same place, that they don't have anything there. If we knew in advance where they were going, or where they want to go, maybe we can make those connections, make those phone calls, and have an advocate or support worker there waiting for them. Let's set them up for success and not failure. We don't want them to come back to the revolving door. Lots of women out there have plans of getting back in contact with family and their children, making those connections and finding those phone numbers, even if it is just a phone number. That's huge. Making that call to say, hey, there's a couple apartments here, Maybe we should put your name in for it. Calling that advocate in their community so that they can also have supports ready. This is what our hope is, to get everybody set up before they get released. And hopefully, like I said, that revolving door stops. So I just want to thank you all so much for joining me today. And just to kind of cover why I feel the InReach program is so important. It's making those connections and setting them up so that they're not coming back into the revolving door of the justice facility. It's working together, getting those assessment and diagnoses done. I'm available to come in at any time to do that paperwork and to help you guys out. I can do the phone calls for you. I can try and get the PAE. It's working as a team. It's us finding those gaps that we're missing and filling them for the individuals that are here. If you have any questions or would like to have a conversation, please don't hesitate to reach out. My name, number, and contact information is all here. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.